This is a video about further complex numbers. I'm going to be looking at some questions from the review exercise in our FP2 textbook. The first question I'm going to look at is number 3. It tells us that the equation z cubed plus 27i equals 0 has the complex roots alpha, beta and gamma. We're told to find the roots, giving our answers an exact Cartesian form. Now, by far the best way of answering a question like this is to write z in modulus argument form. So we'll say that z is equal to r e to the i theta. It follows from that that the cube of r e to the i theta plus 27i is equal to 0. And now we can solve this equation to find out what r and theta are. First of all, we'll say that r cubed times e to the power of 3i theta plus 27i equals 0. And then that r cubed e to the 3i theta is equal to minus 27i. Now minus 27i is simply the complex number with modulus 27, an argument 3 pi over 2. So we can write that as 27 times e to the power of i times 3 pi over 2. Now if you compare the two sides of this equation, it becomes obvious that r cubed must be 27 and 3 theta must be 3 pi over 2, or 3 pi over 2 plus a multiple of 2 pi. Because remember, if you add a multiple of 2 pi to the argument of a complex number, it makes no difference. You've still got the same complex number. So 3 theta could be 3 pi over 2, or 7 pi over 2, or 11 pi over 2, and so on. OK, so it must be that r is 3, and theta could be pi over 2, or 7 pi over 6, or 11 pi over 6, or whatever. So now we know what r and theta are, so we know the modulus and the argument of z. All that remains is to write z in exact Cartesian form. So remember, the modulus must be 3, and the argument could be pi over 2, or 7 pi over 6, or 11 pi over 6, or whatever. Now the first possibility is that theta is pi over 2, in which case we've got the number 3 times e to the i pi by 2. But that's just the same as 3i. The complex number with modulus 3, an argument pi over 2, is obviously 3i. The next possibility is that theta is 7 pi over 6. So in that case we're dealing with 3e to the i 7 pi by 6. And to find that in Cartesian form, we'll need to say that that's the same as 3 times the cosine of 7 pi over 6 plus i times the sine of 7 pi over 6. Remember that that's the same as 3 times minus the cosine of pi by 6 minus i times the sine of pi by 6. And so therefore, it's equal to 3 lots of minus root 3 over 2 minus i over 2, or multiplying it out, minus 3 root 3 over 2 minus 3i over 2. So that's the second possible value of z. The third possible value of z comes from taking theta equals 11 pi over 6. And then we're dealing with the number 3e to the i 11 pi over 6, which can be written 3 times the cosine of 11 pi over 6 plus i times the sine of 11 pi over 6, or as 3 times the cosine of pi over 6 minus i times the sine of pi over 6, which turns out to be 3 root 3 over 2 minus 3i over 2. So here are the three possible values of z in exact Cartesian form. And so alpha, beta and gamma are these three numbers in some order. The next part of this question tells us to show that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 0, and to use that result to find the complex number alpha plus beta cubed. Well, we can show that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 0 simply by adding up our answers. If you add them up, you'll see that it cancels to 3i minus 3i over 2 minus 3i over 2, which comes to 0. So that's easy. The next bit is a little trickier. Since alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 0, we can say that alpha plus beta is equal to minus gamma. And now we can cube both sides. The cube of alpha plus beta must be the cube of minus gamma. 
but the cube of minus gamma will be minus the cube of gamma. And the whole point of gamma is that its cube is minus 27i. So this is minus minus 27i, or simply 27i. So therefore the cube of alpha plus beta is 27i. Another part of the question asks us to verify that minus a third of i alpha is a cube root of unity. And then we've got to use this fact to work out the value of 1, minus a third of i alpha, minus a ninth of alpha squared. Now, to show that something is a cube root of unity, we have to show that its cube is equal to 1. So the task here is to show that the cube of minus a third i alpha is 1. Well, if we cube the bit separately, we've got the cube of minus a third times the cube of i times alpha cubed. And that's going to be minus 1 over 27 times minus i times minus 27i. And if you rearrange the pieces of that, you can see that that's the same as 1 times 1, which is simply 1. So that proves that minus a third of i alpha is a cube root of unity. For the next part, you need to spot that minus a ninth of alpha squared is the square of minus a third of i alpha. Let's check that. The square of minus a third i alpha will be the square of minus a third times the square of i times the square of alpha, which is going to be a ninth times minus one times alpha squared. So it is indeed minus a ninth of alpha squared. Now that's interesting because what it means is that 1 minus a third of i alpha plus a ninth of alpha squared is a special expression. It follows that 1 minus a third of i alpha minus a ninth of alpha squared is 1 plus omega plus omega squared, where omega is minus a third of i alpha, but more importantly, where omega is a cube root of unity. So what we've got here has the form 1 plus omega plus omega squared, where omega is a cube root of unity. And that's interesting, because you should remember that if omega is a complex cube root of unity, then 1 plus omega plus omega squared will be 0. So therefore, 1 minus a third of i alpha minus a ninth of alpha squared will be 0. OK, that's the end of that question. Let's move on to the next question I want to look at, number 5. This one tells us that z is cos theta plus i sine theta, and then we have to use de Moivre's theorem to show that z to the power of n plus 1 over z to the power of n is equal to 2 times the cosine of n theta for any positive integer n. Now this is a really important question, because this idea turns up a lot, and you'll need to be able to prove this fact if you're asked to. Now, <clears throat> z to the power of n is going to be cos theta plus i sine theta to the power of n. And de Moivre's theorem tells us that that's cos n theta plus i sine n theta. Also, 1 over z to the power of n, which is z to the power of minus n, is going to be cos theta plus i sine theta to the power of minus n. And again, using de Moivre's theorem, that must be cos of minus n theta plus i sine minus n theta, which is cos n theta minus i sine n theta. And I hope now you can see that if we add up z to the power of n and 1 over z to the power of n, the sine terms cancel out and the cos term doubles up. So z to the power of n plus 1 over z to the power of n is equal to 2 times the cosine of n theta. The next part of the question tells us to use this fact to express 16 cos to the power of 4 theta in the form something times cos 4 theta plus something times cos 2 theta plus something. Now we're going to use the thing we just proved. So remember, z to the power of n plus 1 over z to the power of n is 2 cos n theta. Well, how can we use this? Well, one thing that you might note is that 16 times cos to the power of 4 theta is the fourth power of 2 cos theta. 
and 2 cos theta is z plus 1 over z. So what we've got here is the fourth power of z plus 1 over z, according to the rule we just proved. Now, let's raise this bracket to the power of 4. Using the binomial theorem, we can expand these brackets and get z to the power of 4 plus 4z cubed times 1 over z plus 6z squared times the square of 1 over z plus 4z times the cube of 1 over z plus the fourth power of 1 over z. And that simplifies to z to the power of 4 plus 4z squared plus 6 plus 4 over z squared plus 1 over z to the power of 4. And if you reorder the terms here, you'll get something really interesting. This is the same as z to the power of 4 plus 1 over z to the power of 4 plus 4 lots of z squared plus 1 over z squared plus 6. And you'll probably see here that z to the power of 4 plus 1 over z to the power of 4 is something we can use, and z squared plus 1 over z squared is something we can use. In fact, z to the power of 4 plus 1 over z to the power of 4 is 2 cos 4 theta, according to the result from before, and z squared plus 1 over z squared is 2 cos 2 theta, according to the result from before. So we've got 2 cos 4 theta plus 4 lots of 2 cos 2 theta plus 6. And that's 2 cos 4 theta plus 8 cos 2 theta plus 6. And this is 16 cos to the power of 4 theta expressed in the form something times cos 4 theta plus something times cos 2 theta plus something. OK, the next part of the question says, given that cos 4 theta is 8 times cos to the power of 4 theta, find two possible values of cos theta. We've got to give the answer in exact form. OK, so we've got the equation cos 4 theta is a half of 16 times cos to the power of 4 theta. And obviously we've just worked out an expression for the right-hand side. So it's equal to a half of 2 cos 4 theta plus 8 cos 2 theta plus 6. Or more simply, cos 4 theta plus 4 cos 2 theta plus 3. Now if you look at the left and the right-hand sides here, you'll see that the cos 4 thetas cancel out. So we're trying to find when 4 cos 2 theta plus 3 equals 0. Now one strategy here would be to subtract 3 from both sides, giving 4 cos 2 theta equals minus 3, and cos 2 theta equals minus 3 quarters. But this isn't getting us towards an exact solution. A better method is to go back slightly and to replace cos 2 theta with 2 cos squared theta minus 1. So now we've got the equation 4 lots of 2 cos squared theta minus 1 plus 3 equals 0. Or 8 cos squared theta minus 4 plus 3 equals 0. Or rather, 8 cos squared theta minus 1 equals 0. 8 cos squared theta equals 1. Cos squared theta equals an eighth. And therefore cos theta is plus or minus 1 over 2 root 2. OK, that's the end of that question. Now let's move on to question 7. This tells us to show that 4 times sine cubed theta is identically equal to 3 sine theta minus sine 3 theta. Well, we can prove this using de Moivre's theorem. According to de Moivre's theorem, cos 3 theta plus i sine 3 theta is identically equal to the cube of cos theta plus i sine theta. And if we multiply out those brackets using the binomial theorem, we get cos cubed theta plus 3 cos squared theta times i sine theta plus 3 cos theta times the square of i sine theta plus the cube of i sine theta. And that simplifies to cos cubed theta plus 3i cos squared theta sine theta minus 3 cos theta sine squared theta minus i sine cubed theta or if we write it in terms of its real component and its imaginary component, we've got the cos cubed theta minus 3 cos theta sine squared theta plus i times 3 cos squared theta sine theta minus sine cubed theta. So now if we equate the imaginary parts on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we discover that sine 3 theta is identically equal to 3 cos squared theta sine theta minus sine cubed theta. And now we're almost there. We simply have to replace cos squared theta with 1 minus sine squared theta, 
giving us three lots of one minus sine squared theta times sine theta minus sine cubed theta. Multiply out those brackets to get three sine theta minus three sine cubed theta minus sine cubed theta and then 3 sine theta minus 4 sine cubed theta. And then we arrange. And we've got that 4 sine cubed theta is identically equal to 3 sine theta minus sine 3 theta. OK, so this is a very important technique that you should remember involving de Moivre's theorem. The next part of the question says, given that 4 cos cubed theta is identically equal to cos 3 theta, plus 3 cos theta, which, by the way, we could have worked out by equating the real parts from the previous equation. Anyway, it tells us to use suitable compound angle formulae to show that 32 times sine cubed theta times cos cubed theta is identically equal to 3 sine theta minus sine 6 theta. Well, you'll probably notice that 32 sine cubed theta cos cubed theta is 2 lots of 4 sine cubed theta times 4 cos cubed theta. And we know expressions for 4 sine cubed theta and 4 cos cubed theta. So it's natural to say that this is double 3 sine theta minus sine 3 theta times cos 3 theta plus 3 cos theta. And if we times out those brackets, we get a complicated expression involving various sines and cosines. We've got 6 sine theta cos 3 theta plus 18 sine theta cos theta, minus 2 sine 3 theta cos 3 theta, minus 6 sine 3 theta cos theta. Let's write those in a different order, because we're supposed to be able to use some compound angle formulae to simplify this. Let's write this as 18 sine theta cos theta, minus 2 sine 3 theta cos 3 theta, minus 6 sine 3 theta cos theta, minus sine theta cos 3 theta. Now the point of that is that sine theta cos theta can be transformed into something to do with sine 2 theta. Sine 3 theta cos 3 theta can be transformed into something to do with sine 6 theta. And sine 3 theta cos theta minus sine theta cos 3 theta can be transformed into something to do with sine 3 theta minus theta. So we've got 9 lots of 2 sine theta cos theta minus 2 lots of sine 3 theta cos 3 theta, minus 6 lots of sine 3 theta cos theta, minus sine theta cos 3 theta. And that would be the same as 9 times sine 2 theta, minus sine 6 theta, minus 6 lots of sine 3 theta minus theta, using some suitable compound angle formulae. And that's just 9 sine 2 theta, minus sine 6 theta, minus 6 sine 2 theta, which simplifies to 3 sine 2 theta minus sine 6 theta, which is the result we were supposed to be proving. Before we go on, note that there's actually a much simpler way of proving this, ignoring the instruction in the question. We can also set about it by saying that 32 times sine cubed theta cos cubed theta is 4 times the cube of 2 sine theta cos theta. But 2 sine theta cos theta is simply sine 2 theta. So this is 4 times the cube of sine 2 theta. But we know from before that 4 times the cube of sine theta is 3 sine theta minus sine 3 theta. So therefore, 4 times the cube of sine 2 theta must be 3 sine 2 theta minus sine 6 theta. And this shows that 32 sine cubed theta cos cubed theta is 3 sine 2 theta minus sine 6 theta, much more simply. OK, the last part of the question asks us to verify that the gradient of the curve with equation y equals sine cubed theta cos cubed theta at the point where theta equals pi by 4 is 0. And we have to find the nature of this stationary point. OK, well obviously we have to find dy by d theta. OK, well dy by d theta will be d by d theta of sine cubed theta times cos cubed theta. And that would be a nightmare to work out, except that we know an expression for sine cubed theta cos cubed theta. We've got to find d by d theta of 1 over 32, 3 sine 2 theta minus sine 6 theta. 
we can take the fraction outside the d by d theta. So this is 1 over 32 times d by d theta, 3 sine 2 theta minus sine 6 theta. And that's 1 over 32 times 6 cos 2 theta minus 6 cos 6 theta. Now when theta is equal to pi over 4, this is giving us that dy by d theta is 1 over 32 times 6 cos pi by 2 minus 6 cos 3 pi by 2, which is simply 1 over 32 times 6 times 0 minus 6 times 0, which is obviously 0. So that proves that the gradient of the curve is 0 when theta equals pi by 4. To find the nature of the stationary point, we need to differentiate again. So dy by d theta is 1 over 32 times 6 cos 2 theta minus 6 cos 6 theta. And differentiating that to find d2y by d theta squared, we've got d by d theta of 1 over 32 times 6 cos 2 theta minus 6 cos 6 theta, which is 1 over 32 times d by d theta, 6 cos 2 theta minus 6 cos 6 theta, which is 1 over 32 times minus 12 sine 2 theta, plus 36 sine 6 theta. And when theta equals pi over 4, that's going to be 1 over 32 times minus 12 sine pi over 2, plus 36 sine 3 pi over 2, which is 1 over 32 times minus 12 times 1, plus 36 times minus 1, which comes to minus 1 and a half. So d2y by d theta squared is negative when theta equals pi over 4, and therefore the stationary point is a maximum. OK, let's move on to question 10. This is asking us to find the Cartesian equation of the locus, the modulus of z minus 2 minus 2i equals the square root of 2. OK, well if we write z in the form x plus i y, we've got x plus i y minus 2 minus 2i equals the square root of 2. And therefore, the modulus of x minus 2 plus y minus 2 times i equals the square root of 2. Well, this means that the square of x minus 2 plus the square of y minus 2 is 2. So that's the Cartesian equation of this locus. We're now asked to find the Cartesian equation of the locus arg z minus 2 equals 3 pi over 4. Now, this is going to be a half line which begins at 2 and makes an angle of 3 pi over 4 radians with the positive real axis. And its gradient is obviously going to be minus 1. Now the full line would have equation y equals 2 minus x, because it passes through both the x and y axes at 2. However, we want a half line, and the half line is just going to be where y equals 2 minus x, and x is less than 2. Now we're told to use algebra to find the complex number which satisfies both loci. Well, that means solving the simultaneous equations, the square of x minus 2 plus the square of y minus 2 equals 2, along with y equals 2 minus x. We do that just by substituting y equals 2 minus x into the first equation, giving us the square of x minus 2 plus the square of 2 minus x minus 2 equals 2. Or more simply, square of x minus 2 plus the square of minus x equals 2. x squared minus 4x squared plus 4 plus x squared equals 2. And so on. 2x squared minus 4x squared plus 4 equals 2. 2x squared minus 4x squared plus 2 equals 0. You can just halve that. Eventually giving us that the square of x minus 1 is equal to 0. And that obviously only has one solution. It means that x is equal to 1. So that's the solution for x. x is 1. And that obviously means that y is also equal to 1. And therefore the complex number satisfying both equations, therefore lying on both loci, is 1 plus i. Now we're told to sketch the loci and state the geometrical relationship between them. OK, well, first of all, the half line given by y equals 2 minus x looks like this. And secondly, the other locus is a circle with centre 2 plus 2i and radius the square root of 2. So that looks like this. And obviously the geometrical relationship between these is that the half line is a tangent to the circle. And by the way, we could have told this 
from the fact that we only got one solution to the quadratic equation we were solving a minute ago. The fact that there's only one solution means that the tangent just touches the circle. If there were two solutions, then the line would have cut the circle twice. And if there were no solutions, then the line wouldn't have met the circle at all. The fact that it meets the circle just once means that it just touches it, and therefore that it's a tangent. Okay, the next question is number 14. Here we're told that in an Argan diagram, the point P represents the complex number Z, where the argument of Z minus 3 over Z plus i is pi by 4. First of all, we're given two complex numbers, minus 1 and 3i, and we're asked to show that they're on the locus of P. And obviously that means showing that they satisfy this equation. So to begin with, let's find what happens if we substitute minus 1 into the expression z minus 3 over z plus i. So we'll work out what minus 1 minus 3 over minus 1 plus i is actually equal to. Still equal to minus 4 over minus 1 plus i. And we can simplify that by multiplying by minus 1 minus i over minus 1 minus i. That gives us 4 plus 4i over the square of minus 1 minus i squared, which is 4 plus 4i over 1 minus minus 1, which is 4 plus 4i over 2, which is 2 plus 2i. And OK, this is a complex number where the real and the imaginary parts are the same, so it lies on the line y equals x, and its argument is clearly equal to pi over 4. Now let's look at the other complex number, 3i, and substitute that into the expression. Let's find 3i minus 3 over 3i plus i. Obviously that's 3i minus 3 over 4i, and we can simplify that by multiplying by minus i over minus i. That gives us 3 plus 3i over 4, or 3 quarters plus 3 quarters of i. And again, that's clearly on the line y equals x, and so it's clearly got argument pi over 4. So that shows that both minus 1 and 3i lie on the locus that we're talking about. OK, now we're asked to sketch it and to label these points on the sketch. So it looks something like this. It's an arc of a circle which begins at 3 and goes anti-clockwise round to the point minus i. And obviously it's a major arc. Minus 1 is there on the negative real axis, and 3i is up there on the positive imaginary axis. So this is the sketch. The next part of the question tells us to find the centre and radius of the circle of which the locus is a part. We've got to give the radius in exact form. Now we can do this just by looking at the sketch. Clearly, the centre of the circle is the same distance away from minus 1 as it is from 3, because they're both points on the circle. So that means that the centre must be on the perpendicular bisector of the line joining minus 1 to 3, because that's the line of all the points which are the same distance from minus 1 as from 3. And by the way, this is the line where x is equal to 1. In a similar way, the centre must be on the horizontal line that's the perpendicular bisector of the line joining minus i to 3i, because obviously it's the same distance away from minus i as it is from 3i, and that horizontal line is the set of all points which are the same distance away from 3i as minus i. And obviously this is the line y equals 1. OK, so that tells us where the centre of the circle is. It's at x equals 1, y equals 1. In other words, it's the complex number 1 plus i. To find the radius, we just have to look at the distance between 1 plus i and the real number 3. And that distance is going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, because 2 is the distance between them along the real axis, and 1 is the distance between them along the imaginary axis. So the radius is the square root of 5. And that's the end of that question. One more question, question 16. We're told that P represents a complex number where Z minus 2 equals Z minus 2i. And first of all, we've got to find the locus of P. 
Well, this is easy. This is the locus of points which are the same distance away from 2 as they are from 2i. Because the modulus of z minus 2 is the distance of z from 2, and the modulus of z minus 2i is the distance of z from 2i. Well, the locus of points which are the same distance away from 2 as from 2i is the perpendicular bisector of the line joining 2 to 2i. So it's a diagonal line like this, which looks rather like y equals x. So now onto the meat of the question. This gives us a transformation from the z-plane to the w-plane, defined by w equals z over z minus 2i. We've got to show that t maps the locus of p in the z-plane to a circle in the w-plane. We've also got to find a Cartesian equation of this circle. Okay, so the method is to start with w equals z over z minus 2i and rewrite it to make z the subject. So first of all, let's multiply both sides by z minus 2i. So w times z minus 2i equals z. Then multiply out the brackets, so wz minus 2i w equals z. wz minus z equals 2i w, and so on. We'll keep going, factorising that. w minus 1 times z equals 2i w. And therefore z is 2iw over w minus 1. Okay, so now we've got z in terms of w. z is 2iw over w minus 1. And we know that the modulus of z minus 2 is the modulus of z minus 2i. So what we do now is we substitute our expression for z into the modulus equation. And then we'll get an equation that only involves w. So we know that the modulus of 2iw over w minus 1 minus 2 is the modulus of 2iw over w minus 1 minus 2i. And this is an equation that only involves w, and if we simplify it, it should be equivalent to the equation of a circle. So let's have a go at simplifying it. An obvious first step is to multiply everything by w minus 1, so that we don't have to deal with fractions, and that gives us this. The modulus of 2iw minus 2 lots of w minus 1 is the modulus of 2iw minus 2i times w minus 1. Multiplying out the brackets, we can simplify slightly, especially on the right-hand side, which just turns into the modulus of 2i. Now, it's a bit tricky having a complex number times w, so let's factorise that out. So what we'll get is the modulus of 2i minus 2 times the modulus of w plus 2 over 2i minus 2 is equal to the modulus of 2i. Now the modulus of 2i minus 2 is 2 root 2, if you think about how far it is away from the origin. And the modulus of 2i is just 2. And if you divide both sides by 2 times the square root of 2, we've now got the modulus of w plus 2 over 2i minus 2 is 1 over root 2. Now this is nearly simple enough to say what the locus of p is in the w plane. The only problem is that we don't know what complex number 2 over 2i minus 2 is, so let's work that out. 2 over 2i minus 2 can be simplified by multiplying by 2i plus 2 over 2i plus 2. So that's 4i plus 4 over the square of 2i minus the square of 2 which is 4i plus 4 over minus 4 minus 4, or 4i plus 4 over minus 8. So that complex number is minus a half minus a half of i. And now we know this, we can say that the locus we're looking at is that the modulus of w minus a half minus a half of i is 1 over the square root of 2. Or put a different way, it's that the modulus of w minus a half plus a half of i is 1 over the square root of 2. And this should be familiar. This is the equation of a circle whose centre is at a half plus a half of i and whose radius is 1 over root 2. And the Cartesian equation of that circle, if we say that w is u plus iv, is the square of u minus a half plus the square of v minus a half is equal to a half. OK, I hope you found it useful having a look at these questions. Thank you very much for watching.